Welcome to Celtic State of Mind, I'm Paul John Dykes and today I am delighted to be joined by Des McLean. Des, welcome to a Celtic State of Mind, how are you doing? It's uh, an absolute pleasure to be here Paul. Um, I was listening to, to some of your podcasts on my daily walk, my daily COVID-19 90 minute walk that I've started doing for the last eight weeks every single day uh, because we've had great sunshine. So I've been looking for things to listen and your your podcast has been, it's, it's been excellent. So it's been perfect for that kind of thing. I appreciate that, Des. I, I made a decision early doors during lockdown to do the podcast daily for two reasons. Obviously, you're providing a wee bit of light entertainment for the Celtic fans who are interested in listening to pods but also just to give myself a wee bit of structure to my day because you know, otherwise I might have been climbing the walls. How are you managing, as well as your daily walk days, how are you managing to keep occupied during these uh, trying times? Uh, trying times indeed. It's just as you said, you need a structure, you need a focus, otherwise you know, you, you, you'll know you go off your head. Uh, homeschooling with a wee fella, my, my wee boy's eight, Harry, and uh, just had his birthday lockdown there. But it seems like everybody's going to have their birthday uh, in lockdown this year, the, the longer it's going on. So I'm, I'm recording sketches at home from Nation Radio, you know, the, the wee comedy sketches. Not that I'm on there a Saturday and Sunday with me and Susan McGuire. And uh, I'm doing the, the walk. I'm doing, I'm, I'm doing loads of things that, that you just never, or you made excuses before that you never had the time to do. But see now, it's actually funny because I was looking forward to doing this with you. And I said to my wife, I don't know when I'm going to fit this in. And she's like, so much, you know, what did we do before? With, with all this? So now every hour, honestly, you're doing something. You're not just going, oh, I'm not sitting about watching the telly. We're doing something. And mm-hmm. you know, even if it's oh, the back garden has been totally, well, my, that was my wife, everything she's about, it looks fantastic. So, um, yes, you've got to be doing something every day, something challenging. Well, there was last night, for instance, uh, I did a virtual comedy club. We had 62 families or, or homes that, that all tuned in via Zoom. So at first I was a bit wary. That's the third one in a row. And uh, you can see the punters. It was a bit like, Celebrity squares, you can see the punters all sitting there. You can see Paul and Five and Ian and Lilithgow and Davey and Margaret and Rikesi and somebody in Australia. It was great. So you're seeing them and you're hearing them laugh. And, you know, there's some. I've been asking comedians, the good thing I had a, I had a comedian on from New York. And, uh, you know, so you can get MD now. You don't, and the thing is, you don't, you can't, you don't need to pick people up and go, oh, right, hurry up, I'll get you there. I'll get you at Bishop Briggs Cross at quarter past eight. They're sitting in the room oh, and probably. they're gigging. So mm-hmm. we had. A lassie from London with a boy from Ireland, uh, Mickey Bartlett, Irish comedian, and Ray Bradshaw, a uh, big uh, football man as well. Was on North. So th- th- it was fantastic. The feedback today, obviously there was a few wee glitches, you know, that you can't help it. But the feedback, so that was good as well. And everybody was saying, oh, Des, great, because it's the next best thing to, we're missing comedy clubs, we're missing the pub, going to the pub, going to a restaurant, going to a wee yeah. cafe, missing families, we're missing outside life, you know. So that Absolutely. was a good thing. A wee bit of escapism last night for... For 62 households that all tuned into Des McLean and Friends comedy in your front room with Zoom. That's brilliant. Des, I think, you know, we're learning and adapting to try and get our output out there. And I think, uh, you know, once we get back to whatever normality is going to be, do you think we'll continue to embrace the technology? Because you can have it both ways then, can't you? So it's been a wee bit up the arse for a lot of things that I've had to go and do. And uh, that, that comedy club, also you saw me last week on Facebook Live. And all this time, I, I, I'm quite ashamed because you've got a facility there that's free. You don't need to pay, you know, a, a producer or a sound engineer or not. So I, I just put my phone in and I set up the tripod. No, I didn't. I'm telling a lie. A guy dropped off a tripod. A listener, a, a guy who was watching me went, I thoroughly enjoyed that wee hour, Des, all the voices, the jokes, the stories. And he left a, he left a tripod oh, yeah. in my driveway. So there you go, the old social distancing. And he says, so it was much better. So I, I went on that, the, the wee Facebook Live, which I should have been doing before anyway, because just to plug t- the wee virtual gig that I was doing on Zoom. And every time I came back in the house, another half a dozen tickets were sold, another half, a, every time I went out and spoke for five minutes. So you should be using all these things. Why not? You should be embracing them all. And, Absolutely, uh, yeah. Even the exercise. I've, I was going to Pure Gym every week, and you were, you know, you're going around and kind of carrying on and not doing the full... Now that we've had to cancel the membership, I'm walking 90 minutes every day. And it is about really just appreciating your surroundings a wee bit more, using the back garden with the wee fella. He's loving it, you know? Oh, it, it was funny when I phoned you at first last week. I think it was last Sunday. It might, one day just rolls into another. Every day is like Sunday, isn't it? And every night's like Friday or Saturday night, depending on how many bottles of wine you consume. Um, but uh, it was funny when I phoned you up and I says, I was walking by with the wee Bluetooth thing. I says, I, says, I, I, I was like, uh, 16 car, we're taking it to Sky. And you says, Des, I'm on the treadmill. And I said, that's even mere animal party. 
I'm on the treadmill working from home. And that, 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 that. So as you, you're starting to, you know, we're all turning into our own little, you know, Bluetooth and thing, and this and that and recordings. So it's all, it's, it's, it's all good, though. It's all good. You're learning stuff. Again, through necessity, you're absolutely right. I mean, obviously the one big thing that we, we talk about on a Celtic State of Mind is our football club days. And as this has developed, I've spoken to a few financial experts, normal Celtic fans, and I'm always asking about their opinions on where we're going to be at the other end. I think what we've been witnessing is nothing short of a soap opera with regards to the club playing out the Ibrox and the SPFL. Celtic are sitting back and just watching it develop. But my actual concern is that Scottish football as a whole, maybe not immediately, but as a result of this, or sped up by this process, I don't think Celtic will be part of Scottish football, Des. And i seen a tweet today from David Lowe, who suggested something similar. What do you think, I mean... I know that you've got the traditionalists and we're going to talk about games that happened, let's say, at Love Street, for example. That whole Scottish tradition is embedded in you as a Celtic fan, but it really has shown itself up for being tin pot over the last couple of months. Do you think maybe Peter Lowell and co are looking elsewhere? They might be forced into that, Paul. They might be. And you're right, it's It's a disgrace. It's a soap opera. It's a pantomime. It's tin pot, exactly as you say. And the thing is, we're, we might end up having to do that. It's not a choice we want to do, but there's going to be, there's businesses going under, there's pubs going, so small, smaller clubs are not going to survive this. No. So, the, the, ob- so are you thinking, you, you said it last week as well, that this could affect the old 10? Well, I think it's the only thing that's going to stop it. <laughs> An actual fact is. I don't even want you to think about it, but I know, I know what you're saying and it's ominous. But there's, there's lower clubs that are definitely, well, hope, I hope I'm wrong, but they're, they're going to go to the ball. And as I say, businesses, small businesses, how, clubs like you've said, St. Martin and what have you, you know, how are these clubs going to survive? They, they can't, no. they can't keep furloughing players and you know, pay staff and, you know, it's just not going to happen. You look at a club, I mean, there's, there's a club just a few miles up the road there, uh, East End Park, Dunfermline, and when they were going through their administration process days, I got involved in fundraising. So I was in and about the place and you got to know quite a lot of the staff up there. And they were in a situation where the kit man was buying the, the kit. So he was buying all the old towels and the tape out his own pocket. You know, the club were not financing that. And Paul Gallagher, you'll remember Paul the goalie, used to play with St Mirren, Dundee United. He was a chef, so he was cooking all the guys their meals. And they were all chipping in out their own pockets. Now that was, for me, Dunfermline growing up was a Premier League football club. And obviously they've been out of the top division for some time. They've got a cracking wee stadium up there. And that's a club just normally how precarious it is financially for a club of that level. And I'm like yourself, I'm looking at it, profit to doom days. And I'm thinking there's going to be clubs that will either go to the wall or they'll turn part-time. And Celtic... If they want to progress in it and they want to still have that kind of focus on European football, etc., I don't think Scottish football is going to be the place for it. And you're right, that is the only way that the 10 would have been stopped. Mm-hmm. And we, we were going, we we're sailing along nicely for another you know, league title and another treble. And, and it's just, it's just all went horribly wrong. No one could ever. But, but you're right, the way that you've just described on Femme there, that is the way that probably another at least dozen clubs. You know, and, and if that was them, that that's the way everybody's going to going to have to behave now. It, it, it's, it's frightening. But what about the old Bundesliga start next week? It's that that's frightening in itself as well. Eh? Can you do the old social distancing? You know, playing but in a mark him no no two meters. You know, what I mean, how is it going to happen? You know, with, with regards to this necessity to get the clubs back playing, and it's all down. It's all down to money. It's all down to money days. And I think football had gone so far there that, you know, just one thing, or as massive as it's been, that the whole house of cards just falls, you know. And the whole model of English football, for example, just to use an, an example, um, has been shown up for what it is. I used to react to people who said, you know, if Celtic came down to England, they wouldn't be top eight. And my counter-argument was always, if any club came from the English Premiership, they'd go bust in a fortnight. Because if you want to talk about it like that, it wouldn't be... Celtic as they are now, Celtic would go down and have the, the finances would go through the roof and we'd be able to compete with the same players and offer the same wages. So there's no way we would be left languishing at the bottom of the Premier League. But any club down there, because they've built their financial model so precariously, if, they, if something like this happens or if they were playing in Scottish football, they would go bust. And quite a few of the kind of bigger clubs are facing down the, the, the barrel of a gun at the moment. And by the way, you're absolutely right. And it's all the TV money now and it's all down to that. But I've had that same debate with so many people and you're thinking, that is staggering. Celtic would be an even bigger brand down there. 
They wouldn't just they, they wouldn't just fit in or hold their own. You'd be sitting top four. Celtic are a massive brand. They would be up there, and we at Celtic would be sixty. 30, a lot of these teams down there don't even get thirty thousand. The Celtic would be packing out. You imagine playing the Chelsea's, Man U's, Arsenal's on every other week. Oh, Celtic are worldwide. You know, like, teams like Newcastle and all that. You know, they're not in Celtic's league when it comes to the the, the, the brand and Leicester. You know. And all these things, we wee dig up Brenda there, can I, can I just say, absolutely. Uh, sorry. <laughs> so, you know what I mean? That was more Martin O'Neill there. And, you know, when I came here, I, I saw, you know, Paul John Dykes and I said, you know, I thought his podcast was okay, but, but I was wrong. It was absolutely, absolutely sensational. So, uh, <laughs> you know, I was meant to be chatting to Martin O'Neill during this process of lockdown. We had a gig and um, I must admit, Desi, was one of the ones I thought to myself, I'm a wee bit nervous speaking to him. So I was chatting to Chris Sutton and John Hartson uh, who were also on the bill, and I says to them, I'm a wee bit nervous, guys, and he goes, so are we, so are we, because he's still our gaffer, you know, and he just has that air about him. Have you ever met Martin O'Neill? Yes, I met him. It was, I was doing a gig, I, I was doing like Celtic Player of the Year things and all that and, and stuff, and uh, I went, Neil Lennon got me a ticket for Seville, and I, I was sitting next to his, his mum and dad and stuff like that, and it was amazing. And uh, O'Neill, he is, he's a man of few words, but he's got that, you know, he's got that same thing that obviously Steen and Clough and all these guys, you know, he's just got that respect. He's a man of few words as well. I remember Sutton saying that. It was just a couple of words and that bit, and he wasn't a man for hanging about and all that. And, and I, yeah, mate, but he, he, was, he was dead serious. He was always dead serious. But I always had him doing kind of quite a funny, well, a, a guy with a good sense of humour and all that. I remember he was talking about when he got dropped for the European Cup final and Clough had dropped him and he was raging. You know, I think it was the first one or second. It might have been Malmo. It was a final anyway and he dropped him. He had a niggling injury and he knew he wasn't fit. And, he, and he, he says he gave Clough the Vicky, the two fingers. And he went, I'll let, I'll let that go, young man. I've seen that in the, refle- in the re- reflection in the window. As he walked by, you know, and I just thought, you know, the, the, uh, that's, by the way, that's my favourite ever. That, that uh, football movie, it's absolutely astounding. Michael Sheen. Yeah. So, so, I, so I, you associate uh, O'Neill with, you know, that Clough was his gaffer. And then, yeah, uh, Sutton and uh, Harps and Larsa, that was their man. That, that, that was the, their biggest years in football. And, yeah, that he will always be the gaffer to them, aye, the bold O'Neill. Yeah, I'm glad you brought up Neil Lennon because, and going further back to O'Neill and Clough, because I always see it as a procession and, you know, handing down the baton almost as Brian Clough. Martin O'Neill would have, even without trying, been influenced by Clough's managerial processes. And I think Lennon would have also had the same process with O'Neill. Do you think... Because obviously O'Neill won European Cups with Nottingham Forest, as did Brian Clough. Do you think that Lennon has got something in him? Because I've been discussing this as well, Des, and particularly this season, I've seen a lot of positives in our European performances that we weren't getting out of Brendan Rodgers. You, you, let, Rodgers was going toe-to-toe with the likes of Barcelona and all that. You know, that was madness. And, and you're, you're like, you can't do that. Just park the bus. Just park the I remember Matt McLone saying, this is not good. You need to just play ugly for this one. It's not good for the kids and all that to get seven goals hammered by them. You can't. That is when we should have just went right. We need to play ugly and we need to get through this. Maybe get beat a two one or three one. Oh, well, even that's wishful thinking. And that was madness. But Roger still had that arrogance where he'd done nothing wrong. After you know, we get we get hammered with them. We get hammered with PSG. It was silly. So there's there's no question. There's no question about that. I think Lennon, when he came back to Celtic at, at the time, we were all saying, "Oh wait a minute, this is not box office and no, all that." So it's Lennon, da da da. But and it, when Lennon came back, he, he really, he showed a maturity. And he'd, he'd obviously learned a few lessons, stuff like that. And, and he will always be a passionate guy, <laughs> like, to put it mildly. He's all, you know, and there's nothing wrong with that. But uh, when he came back, Celtic in Europe, was, I mean, that was incredible. I believe that, I, I know people are going to argue with this, right? I know we beat Barcelona 2-1 at Parkhead, right? That was an amazing result. But I think that Lazio away was an even better result. And I'll tell you why, because Barcelona hammered us that night. It was Barcelona versus... Yeah. Yeah. Right, they hammered his big foster. We went over to Lazio. We'd never won in Italy, ever. Ever. You know, that was the first result in Italy. And we went over there. By the way, we were all over them in the second half. It's a good point you make there about the Barca game because you, you look back in a kind of haze of uh, reminiscence and you think, wow, what a result. But it was young Neely Mocking that spoke to me and he says, Paul, I hated it that night. I hated it because we were under the cosh so much. Fair enough, the result and everything else. But I think when you look at even the possession, it was it was something like 70-30. It wasn't far off of that, you know? No, and the, the thing that gets you right now, when, when a team like Barcelona, I mean, that, that team were up there, the greatest of all time. When a team like Barcelona, nickname your goalkeeper, The Wall. 
that just shows you, you know, what they... We were hammered that. I mean, we were we were like absolute battered. It was like the, I mean, all it was like the opening scene of Saving Private Ryan. <laughs> Every time we were like, no, it was the longest ninety minutes ever. Nice. So it was an amazing result against the best team in the world, right? Of course, Lazio aren't as good as them, but for Celtic to go away, you know, and play the way they did that night, Celtic were amazing. And that final goal, the wee chip, fantastic, awesome. In chart, I just think he's one of the guys that he always gives us a wee taster of what he can do, Des. But we've never seen it for 20 games on the bounce kind of thing. I think he's got it in him. And I think Lennon is capable of dragging that out of him. When you look at the man management, I've mentioned before, Lennon's man management is Scott Brown, for example. Brown really started performing under Lennon first time round. Uh, Lee Griffiths uh, as well. He gave James Forrest his debut. I, I just think Lennon's a, a good man manager and, and he could. I mean, Encham was talking about leaving and all that in the summer, remember, he was talking to the French press Lennon didn't go off his head at him or berate him uh, in public. He just, you know, quietly got on with it and actually got a performance out of the guy. And he'll be remembered forever, you know, with the celebration, everything about that goal. You're absolutely right what you say. You know, it's frustrating. See if, see if uh, Rogic and the Bold Oliver, see if they two could play at their peak every game. We would have the yeah. best midfield. Those two are absolutely, have got touches of real, real European class. I mean, like cl- class acts, but the consistency just isn't there. And that's it. But you're absolutely right. You see all the assumptions, you go, why are we not getting that every week? And Rogic as well. I mean, there's certain raves and raves and raves about him. They, they, you know, they, when you see some of the stuff, some of the goals that he scored against Rangers with that left foot, magical. But then there's other times where he breaks your heart and you're like, oh, come on, Tom. You know, and he's just not in it. And no, he, no, no. He's worse than a man sure. And it's frustrating. It must be so frustrating because you know these guys can do it. You're talking about consistency. One of my biggest favourites of the kind of modern day was Samaras. And Samaras and consistency certainly didn't go hand in hand. When he was good, he was dynamite. And then when he was bad, he was just a man short. So when you think back through your Celtic support and life days, who stands out as your own heroes, you know, going back to your youth and then coming through watching Celtic? Can I just touch on that Samaras thing there? That's interesting. Samaras is one of these guys who will always split the audience. He'll always 50, right? And when I was, we were over in uh, Greece, a lovely wee place, uh, Zakynthos. It was a wee glimpse of heaven. Four years in a row, lovely wee place, right? But he, even me and you, the waiter came over and I was like, oh, Olympiacos, da, 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 and you've talked football. Now, the universal language of football is always good with old waiters and all that. And, it, and, I went, and they went, uh, Celtic, uh, Glasgow, uh, Rangers. And I went, Celtic, and they turned around and went, and I went, Samaras, and they went, hey, lazy bugger, even they knew. <laughs> they were saying, no, he, uh, hair, 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 and uh, oh, look at me, I love, it. Right? even they were saying, he loves himself, but he's a late, so even they knew, Samaras looked apart, he sounded apart, and there was games again, remember that Brown game against Rangers, where it was a Samaras, and he, he, would, he would go and defy all odds, and you'd be like, I can't believe the big man, but he should have been, if he, he's another one, if he was consistent, then, then, uh, Yes, definitely. But you're talking about a certain player, right? You know how at the moment we're watching YouTube, everything on it. I was sitting, and the good thing with YouTube is you watch something and it will take you conveniently, and all of that, oh, let, let's watch this. So I'm sitting, wife's went to bed, I'm sitting there up to one in the morning, you're doing this. And it, it just made me realise an amazing player Paul McStay was. Mm-hmm. Because in 1982, he was playing in a 3 2 game. McLeod scored the winner, and he was the man of the match. He was 18, right, man of the match. And he, he was crunching tackles like Kieran Tierney, and he was passing the ball, you know, like, like the inch perfect. And he was raw, and he was like pure. It, it was just amazing. What a player. But then 15 years later, in 1987, he was man of the match when he ran the show against Rangers. And the interesting thing is, we did a week in a Celtic group chat, and one of my mates was saying, well, it depends what era you were brought up. And he says, because he says he started going to the games when it was the Liam Brady. Yeah. And he was saying McStay wasn't wasn't as good as Collins then, and that McStay did take a wee dip then. Do you remember that? Definitely. And a lot, I remember at the games we were all arguing. I'm going to McStay, da, da, and they're all going. You know, Collins was a man, obviously at the time. He was he just. You're thinking it was it was an absolute disgrace that John Collins only <laughs> won one trophy for mm-hmm. for, for Celtic against Erdy. That that the point don't think me. But McStay did kind of go off the boil then, but then he came back, he bounced back. But it was funny. I still remember that time. Remember we were saying Peter Grant always kind of split the cloud and the bold Anton Rogan, you know, at heart of a, a line that bit. That was funny when I was like, what are you talking about? McStay's the best ever and all that because we're talking about all-time 11. And he went, no, no, at that time. But then again, it was it was uh, desperate times, wasn't it? The old Brady McCarry. It was, Des. I mean, we do a thing actually on a Sunday night and it's the Celtic State of Mind Video Club, right? It, it was kind of uh, inspired by Tim Burgess. He does the, the listening parties on Twitter. So he'll get somebody from a band to get involved in the chat and everybody plays the album at let's say 8 o'clock at night and then the guy for the band chats them through the songs and people ask questions and stuff so we've been doing something similar with the Axom Video Club 
And people are so interested in the 90s, even though it was really rubbish, it was really poor what were being served up. But you're putting on the Celtic collection videos and you've got Andy Payton scoring goals and Jerry Craney and all these guys. You know, looking back, and this is relevant to today and where we are with the SPFL and Rangers because we were absolutely murdered back then. But two things, we used to laugh at ourselves for it and also we'd done something about it. This mob now, going through this this pantomime as you described it, they're being fed a line by... Whoever it might be, and they're taking it all in. They're not questioning anything. They needed ten million pounds by the end of last month. Nobody's worried where that ten million pounds came from. You know, it's just another ten million pounds of debt. Nobody's questioning it, Des. And what's going to happen is, invariably, they'll be back where they were in two thousand and twelve. Whereas the Celtic fans club together. You mentioned Mark McGlone, he was a massive part of that. And they were organised and they were able to kind of overturn the old regime. There's a different attitude with the the club playing out Ibrox and now in the fan base who, I don't know if they believe that they can never be toppled. There's an, an elite attitude to them, Des, and it will be their undoing once again, I believe. We were discussing this and people are starting to think that Rangers are just trying to, you know, like, right, you know, like the wee spoiled brat in this class that everybody's doing well. I'm going for like, no, they want to just kind of a self-harm and torpedo themselves so that they won't be here for the nine and the ten and stuff like that, you know. <laughs> or it's like, well, we're not playing, we're not family. They... they you know, th- this should have been a result for the for Rangers because Celtic were going for that fourth treble and, and you know, it's us that are losing out and it's all this all tainted titles and all this carry on that year. You know, I, w- I wouldn't put it past them, but you know that Stuart Roberts said on play the other night, they didn't say that they were coerced and really <laughs> and all that. So, so even though we all heard them saying it and it was a public document and they said it many times and that, that, was, that was incredible. It's embarrassing, to be fair. And you, you've mentioned what you're doing at the moment comedy-wise, Des. Talk us through your introduction to comedy. I spoke to a friend of yours, Susie McCabe, on a Celtic State of Mind, and I says to her, when did you realise you were funny? There must be, or is it just, oh, is it omnipresent where you're just able to make people laugh from a young age and you're not quite sure how you're doing it? Uh, from a, I remember uh, as a wee boy, the parties, and it was, uh, they would put a wee bonnet around or they would come in, and, and I, I was always doing the impersonations at the it was always whoever was on the telly and Frank Spencer and other thing. And I was always, my head was always full of carry on. And every job I'd done, the only highlight was lunchtime where I would entertain them on telling funny stories and do all, the, all the, the, the voices and all that. So it was the only thing that I was any good at. And, it was, and uh, I, I, there was a, a comedy club called Blackfriars in Merchant City. It was the only comedy club at the time in Scotland. And uh, I, I went doing, I really, I, I went doing. And uh, I went to a wee comedy course run by Viv G. She'd been doing it for, for years now. And uh, after that, I kind of, I was, I had the, the bug, but I didn't know what to do. There wasn't many comedy clubs in, in Glasgow. There was near the stand. There wasn't any jonglers, nothing like that. So I went along and I did a five minute open spot. And it went really well. It was all over the place, but there was a few wee highlights. And then the BBC, I went the following Sunday night. The BBC were recording for the BBC New Comedian of the Year. So they, they said to me, we've recorded you. You're in the second round. I was like, what? Ah, second round. I was like, really? I was like, oh my God. So I beat Jimmy Carr in the semi-final in King Tuts. I beat him. Where, where is he now? <laughs> so uh, I beat him and I got to the final. I, I ran over my eight minutes really badly. I, I, I talked for Scotland. So but it was amazing. So you get a £1,000 and you know, you're know way to the fringe. So that was the first one. Then the following year, I went to the fringe and I did a one-man show called Des McLean Five Stars. It wasn't he, like, it was me and McDonald's with a five-star thing still in there. It was quite a cheeky wee title that got a few punters in. So then after that, I was on the BBC Live Floor Show when BBC, you know, had when a lot of people were watching telly back then, they'll now. And it, that was a good wee break. So after that, I joined, uh, did a few more fringe shows. And the, then you were starting to do long shows in Glasgow and the, the comedy festival and stuff like that. And then I joined Radio Clyde. So between for six years, and I became the Des McLean 810 sketch uh, guy in the morning with Plunge McNugget and the, the Billy Connolly phone call, oh my word. So we phoned up everybody, by the way, I phoned up, we made 3,000 phone calls, you're not going to believe it. Paul Cooney used to run and go, what, 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 why is Plunge McNugget phoning the Vatican? Why is, is <laughs> Ralph Brisbane phoning the White House? We were phoning the White House and the Vatican and the bold George Bowie. So, so I would, and the best thing was, I need to, I need to tell you, that's right, I, would, I phoned up Rod Stewart as Billy Conley and I went, I haven't seen you at Parkhead for a while, you nutter. Rod Stewart was, on, was in Clyde and he's going, you all right, Billy? And I'm in an our studio and I'm going, aye, so how was I not invited to your wedding, you fucking nutter? How are you? Oh, you mad. And he was going, oh, I'm sorry, Billy, it's, it's down to the wife. 
Rod Stewart's actually backpedalling and apologising for not saying that. And I feel I'm caused all sorts of here. So we phoned Joan Rivers, the late Joan Rivers, Quentin Tarantino, oh, he was a, uh, Walter Smith, oh, uh, Gordon Stratton. Walter Smith and Gordon Stratton went mental, right? I mean, really. So it just shows you the pressure of the old. But the best one was Sean Connery, Paul. Sean Connery, right? James Bond, you know, you're growing up, James Bond, the coolest guy. Ever. And he, he was doing a book signing in, in, in Waterstones in Edinburgh. And George Bibby went, why don't you phone up? I went, no, no, no. I went, Sean Connery's doing a book signing. I'm not, he went, perfect, Billy Connolly, Sean Connery. I, it was a bank holiday Monday, I'll never forget it. And I went, why would Billy Connolly be phoning up? Go try, try, just the eight days. I went, okay, if it doesn't work out, just please try it, okay. So I phoned up and uh, I went, how the, how the devil are you? It's, it's Billy Connolly here. I'm looking to speak to, to Sean Connery. Aye, so as you there? And she went, uh, there's now Sean Connery here in that horrible Edinburgh accent that she had. And I went, there you go, I tried. And I went out to my motor, I'm no joking. And I was driving away, I went, yes, getting up the road. And Bowie came, banged it up the windscreen. Dead. Sean Connery's on the phone. Sean Connery's on the phone. Looking for you. <laughs> well, looking for Bully Connolly. I went, oh, you're joking. I'm going to get in there and you're going to go, aye, aye. Very. I went, oh, Des, go in, go in. This is comedy gold. This is comedy gold. So I went in, I put the headphones on, record, and I went, how the devil are you? And they went, Billy, 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 how are you? And I went, oh, and I, I don't know why. I don't know why. I just went, ba-da-da-dum, ba-da-dum, ba ba da 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 Da, da, da. And then I went, we were expecting you, you fucking nutter. <laughs> I'm calling Sean Connery a fucking nutter, right? So we dick for a bro. And Connery went, <laughs> he's laughing away and all that. And all, all, the, all the news team are saying, don't go there, Billy. He'll sue, his people will sue. He, right, he doesn't have a sense of humour and all that. And I went, aye, so, so, what you been up to? And I, you know, at this time, off call, we're coming down big, right, big time. And I thought, I, can't, I don't want this call to go because, you know, you needed permission for the phone calls and all that, right? And so, so uh, he's talking away and talking away. And he was brand new and he was laughing away. And he turned to me and do, do, do you want to meet? You know, we could, we, we could meet for lunch in the Scotchman Hotel in Edinburgh. They obviously met there. If we could go to your suite, you know, Billy. And, and I went, why don't we meet halfway at Heart Hill Services, you fucking <laughs> madman? <laughs> well, I'll treat you to a wee gunster, you fucking nutter. And, and, he, and he was laughing away and laughing away. 28 minutes later, he's still on the phone. And I turned around and I went, and I went so I, I ran out of things to say to Sean Connery. And I, the poor guy's on the phone. And then I went, so, so, I went, have you any juicy movies coming up? Any big gigs, mama? And he went, you, you, you know I haven't, Billy. I, you were the first I told. And he went, I'm going to have to go. And he went, you know, I don't think that was Billy Connolly. Beep. And hung up the phone. And I went, <laughs> yes, a dancer. Right. And, I, and, and so I, I went, George, we, we didn't get permission. And the bull, where we went, I can be fine. I went, right. And I went, no, no, no. Yeah, we can't put that out. This isn't Sean Batty. This is Sean Connery. Right. The next morning, it went out. And it was amazing. The emails. Got, and I was like, oh, no, right. And like, nothing happened. I was expecting, you know, and it was in front of the papers, 007, it's, you know, it's, De- it's James Cond, funny man Des, you know, and his licence to thrill, all the usual kind of right, headlines. And then nothing happened. I thought, oh, we got away with that, we got away with that. And then two weeks later, I'm doing it at Celtic Park, and I'm collecting, usually when I tell this at gigs, you get a boo off all the, all the Rangers, and them, so I can tell you. So I'm doing it at Celtic Park, and I walk to it, and I, I, there's a big cheque for Cash for Kids, from Celtic, there you go. Thank you. Celtic to Cash for Kids, £50,000. There's my claim. And I walk back and uh, to my seat. And guess who's standing over my seat, staring at me? Billy Conley. And Conley just stared and went, McLean, you wee fucker. <laughs> and, and right, and now forget what you said, Paul. I went, I'm going to end up apologising the rest of my life for you, you fucking madman. And I went, is, is that about. Aye, aye, that's having the poor old fucker on the phone for half an hour, you dirty. Right, and then I went, Billy, they made me do it. They made me do it. I said, I, I didn't want to do it. I went, it was just a laugh, Billy. I went, just a laugh. It was fucking brilliant. Right, and he gave me a big hug, and I thought, oh. Of course, you already had a relationship with Billy Connolly, a friendship with him, because he gave you a run home to your mum's house, is that right? In Black Hill. Yeah. See when people, see when people say, oh, Billy Connolly thinks he has something new and all that nonsense, right? Absolute nonsense, right? The guy, he was going to Edinburgh, yeah, uh, through Edinburgh, and he went, where, 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 do you, where do you want dropped off? And I was like, oh, no, no, no. That, I went, you're all right, Billy. I'd met him doing it at the Hilton, and we, we sat there for oh, a couple of hours. He's sitting with a wee pot of tea and all that. And, that. and I'm going, this is oh, Billy Connolly. See, when I first met him, it was like seeing Elvis Presley, right? It wasn't like, see, it was like, he was my hero. For a wee boy, I remember. The, and then he went, oh, I'll drop you there. 
he dropped me at Black Hill where my master is. She still stays there. And we were driving down and he shouted over at my ma. I went, I was like, any chance? He went, ah, but I'm now your son's chauffeur, Patsy. Oh, he's made it now. Billy Conley's his chauffeur. Brilliant. How are you doing? Is that your grand? And I, couldn't, he, couldn't he be any nicer or, or more down to earth or humble? So whenever I hear that, you know, you're thinking, no, 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 no. The, guy, the guy's been absolutely brilliant. A lovely, lovely man. So that, that's my hero, yes. How does it feel, though, for a, a Scottish comedian, Des? How does it feel when someone like Billy Conley states that you're his favourite comedian? Well, you play football, didn't you, Paul? Yes. You yes. imagine that man up there, Messi, or even Larson, saying, ah, but, uh, you know, that Paul John Dykes, oh, he knows how to kick a ball. You, it, would give you, it would give you a tingle, wouldn't it, through your... So, but I'm driving up the road, uh, I mean, I'll never forget it, Friday afternoon, and my mate phoned me up and went, I'm listening to Radio Scotland there, they're interviewing Billy Connolly, Janice Forsyth, and he would turn around, so he went, Have you seen, there's a guy called Des McLean, oh my God, he's brilliant, have you seen him? Oh my, he's my favourite at the And I was like, I didn't believe my mate when he told me, then my other mate phoned me up who didn't know him, and he went, Billy Connolly's gave you a mention. Oh, that went down well with the comedians, <laughs> that put a lot of noises. See that night when I got the CD, from the guys at Radio Scotland. Oh my, I remember sitting playing it over and over that wee line and I was sitting going, I just kept playing it. And I'm, <laughs> my wife is, you're pathetic. I went, it's Billy Conley. Are you kidding? And that would be the equivalent of you playing football, right? And like Maravchek passing the ball and you heeding it. And you'd be playing that wee, that goal all your life, wouldn't you? Never <laughs> more. Yeah. No, it was amazing. It was amazing. It was a dream come true. You, you were saying there, you know, how would it feel if Larson or Messi said that? I'm just looking for... Rudy Vata to say that to me, Des, because Rudy plays centre half for for the Celtic Old Boys, and he goes through me every single time because I'm no good enough. I see the wee forty he stand at the front, uh, and uh, the the, the, the fiveies. Uh. He takes it so ser- seriously, Des. But he's got the Albanian president involved in like retweeting the games and all this kind of stuff, you know, because that's his big pal. Well, every little helps. Absolutely. We've spoken about Billy Conley. See, Scottish comedy, you know, when I was growing up was, was very healthy. I always think back and I think back to things like obviously Billy Conley, but coming up to the, the kind of modern era, you've got your Kevin Bridges, your Frankie Boyle, that kind of era. But I also loved, you know, the stuff that Phil Differ did with the Only an Excuse in the early days Des, I thought it was it was kind of groundbreaking. They used to sell the cassettes and the fanzines. It eventually got into the charts and all this kind of stuff. Um, and then you've got your rap scene, Nisbet, and you've got all that kind of stuff. What is it about Scottish comedy? And, and is it still as healthy now as it was during the uh, my kind of upbringing in the 80s? It's funny because Ian Patterson was a... a, a I, I thought the guy was a great writer, and he is. Phil Differ's a very, very good pal of mine. And uh, just messaged yesterday with a few wee, uh, laughs. Um, and Ian Patterson, a very mild-mannered, lovely man, you know, and when you see... Oh, it's, it's a show about swat. Have you got a hand in my waist on that, Jamesy boy? Eh? Yeah, he's right, man, well, because no man will munch with the old drab sheen or that. I think she's missing a snarler. I think she's missing a tadger boy, right? And see if you've met Ian, he's just a... You know, very erudite, lovely man, and I mean, but, but we were discussing this. Remember about certain people who, when you, you meet them, you go, "God." So, uh, uh, yes, yeah, Scottish comedy's always been brilliant. It's always been a bit mad and crazy and aggressive. Billy, obviously, back in the day when he, when he, they almost have been like, "What is that?" You know, but Rab C was groundbreaking because it was just this mad, <laughs> this mad <laughs> Alki, this madman who was always going to get his gyro and. A, See you, let me tell you this boy. And he was a brilliant, you know, psychologist as well in life and stuff like that. So I, I well, I did uh, I, Tommy for, for Ian Patterson. Of course, he wrote that. And that was brilliant as well. I mean, that was really, really funny all the way through. So Ian Patterson, uh, a brilliant, brilliant writer. But uh, yeah, you're right about the only excuse. I remember when it came out and it was round about, I think, I'm, I'm, I might be a year out here, but I think we're talking, it was when Celtic really needed a laugh. Uh, around about 94, 95, 96, wasn't it? Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah. I remember that the, the the at the time Jerry McNee who was that was sitting in the audience and all that. And remember McNee was was you you'd always got to read his column that the guy's going number eight and all that we call him right. McNee I thought was a good kind of confrontational you know thing. And uh, you saw them sitting there and they're all laughing away and they're taking the piss out of them and there was nothing else like that nothing else like that. Um, only excuse and they were they were you know how do you know he's a Protestant? Well he looks like one. Remember all that? <laughs> that it was really good. Uh, you know, did Tam Cowan write from as well for Phil Differ, obviously stuff like that. And but now everything's you know everybody's a star on Facebook and all that now, and the people are all making their own things, and it's totally you know it's totally fractured now. And if you know what I mean, and it's that's great, but it's like you know you go to put the telly on now, and uh, the long gone are the days of a. Uh, 
I remember like, like everybody on a Monday morning going, did you see that audience with Willie Connolly last night? And the whole of Scotland had watched it. Yeah. No. If I say to you, what, which season are you on the Breaking Bad? You'll go, oh, I've, I'm just at season, oh, I'm season four. It's, we're all watching the telly and box sets at different times and all that. And it's a wee bit of a shame, you know. Did you see that thing last night? No, no, I didn't see it. I'm watching this. It's all kind of finished, all that, isn't it? Completely changed nowadays, isn't it? I mean, it's no longer part of that day-to-day routine of coming home, half seven, watch whatever on the telly. And you think you'll catch up or it's on demand, like you say, you know, Netflix and Amazon Prime and that kind of stuff. And there is a wee bit of a sadness to that as well, because I, I think uh, the introduction of comedians and, and comedy was, was great. I was watching, actually, just last night, in between uh, editing a podcast, I was watching a lot of kind of, you know, the young ones and Rick Mail and Ben Elton and all that kind of stuff. And it's just like unbelievable looking back now, thinking to myself, that was tremendous. Nothing quite like it, really, since then. It was amazing. And Ben Elton, uh, he was touring again there. And uh, Ben Elton was an incredible... Remember Saturday Night Live and all that, right? Ben Elton would come out, and he would he'd come out with all this topical material, and he was brilliant, and, and you were like, wow, this guy... He, he, it was just whatever happened that week, he was bang, 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 great. And he kind of fell away, he went, writing a lot of good things like that. When I say fell away, he obviously made, he made enough money and what have you, but... Aye, the young ones were, were nobody'd ever seen anything like that either. Because you would stuff like Monty Python and all that, there was a real acquired taste for a lot of people that and then and then the young ones did come out and it was totally you know, it's just you know, a mad punk putting an axe through his head and then Rick's done again, Oh, look at me like, and it was, it was mental and Neil and all that. It was and it was really, really good. But there's th- there's things like that, like only if it was in horses, faulty towers, I know it's we the old cliche. They have not they do not show their age at all. There's other stuff you look back at Love Thy Neighbour and you're going, oh, you can't show that now, that's shocking. But when you look at 40 Towers, a masterpiece. Mm-hmm. It's like it's like it's like a Frank Sinatra song or a thing. You go, that that will never ever age. And you're still laughing. Uh, I was laughing away at an old Rab C Nesbit thing, mate. The old naked video as well, uh, all that stuff. And uh, like you meant, the young ones. Um I there was some cracking stuff on, but even fools and horses as well, you know. I know it's a wee bit more gentler and all that, a wee bit more. I'm sitting with the father, the mother and father-in-law at Christmas here and we sat and watched a few of the Christmas specials. Fantastic stuff. Aye, you know, real aye. sad and then bursting out laughing at the same time. Good old Del Boy and all that. Again, going back to someone who you know really well, Susie, Susie McCabe, she gave a really good insight into the comedy circuit and how Celtic fans probably because they're good at self-deprecation, but Celtic fans have got a sense of humour. Des, and is that something that really goes to the roots of the makeup of a Celtic fan, I guess, where you, you look at, the, you know, the, the oppression, the, the Irish diaspora, you always find humour in, in bad situations, and maybe that's, and then people always grab an acoustic guitar and sing, and, and that's where the music comes into it, you know. It seems to me, and no one's told me uh, any different, it seems to me that Celtic fans have got that. They've got the, the artistic creativity, they've got the sense of humour. Have you found that yourself working within that field? Absolutely. I, I can't put my finger on it completely right, but like if you talk about Kevin, we Susie and, and Kevin Bridges and Frankie Boyle and Billy Conley, you get through them all, right through them all. And it's, it, I think it's because, I remember a time, uh, it was Graham Spears, the journalist says, Celtic fans need to have a sense, it's just something they need, they've got a, a real sense of humour. It's, it's their, their kind of a release valve, it's a, the, the it's, we, because at that time when we were really in dire straits and we're all singing, there's only two Michael Kellys when a fox ran on the park. Right? <laughs> now, we, we, were, we were heading for the iceberg, big time there, right? Big time. And we're still singing funny songs. I remember they're butted. We're all, I remember that night and we're all arguing with the, like, the people who were, were uh, anti, like, Save Ourselves and all that, Aunt Matt McLone, they were all arguing, fighting with us. I mean, like, like shouting and bawling. And it was horrible. I think, I think there was 11,000 there that night. But we're still singing funny songs. And I remember Graham Spears saying, Rangers fans have got this real hard-edged anger to them. Like, they must not, they won't tolerate. We, we're on a win and run. We cannot, I thought, and Celtic, we were fifth in the league and we're singing Always Looking the Right Side of Life. We, we need to have that. And Celtic fans mm-hmm. have always got that. That is self-deprecating. And I don't know if it's because we had to go and confess to the priest every week whether we liked it or no, <laughs> the vast majority. <laughs> so I think that's it. And sometimes we made up, I just made up funny routines that never happened to get a wee couple of Hail Marys now out of there again. I don't know if that's got something to do with it, but there is a deal where you can't kid them on. And a few of my mates, like, like you, you, have, you make a wee joke about Rangers, and it's like, oh, I need for that. I, and you're going, it was a joke, you know, but it is, it's, I don't know, I can't, 
but definitely the amount of Celtic fans that are comedians is incredible. And we're all laughing at the moment, that's for sure, Des. We've mentioned a couple of people here. You've, you've mentioned Phil Differ. I know that Phil just had a, a really successful play with Jim McLean, the Jim McLean play just before lockdown. And um, Save Our Celts, Jim Orr was involved in Save Our Celts in the very, very early days. And Jim took to, when he was approaching retirement, took to writing plays. So he wrote Bend It Like Baxter, Bend It Like Brat Back. And, you know, it was a huge success. It was a massive success. It was outstanding, wasn't it? For a la- by the big, huge laughs from start to finish. And my wife thought it was just a funny, funny play. She knows very little about football. That's a good, a good sign. And again, I think everything about it was, you know, you've got Jim there who he obviously had this concept. And I remember him sending me the script and I thought to myself, I couldn't put that script to, to Jim's character. You know, it's like what you said before. It was interesting. Now, he's obviously got a plan. He's got a plan, and you're part of that plan, Des. So could you maybe share with us how Bend It Like Bratback is going to be followed up by Jim and how you're going to be involved? Well, Bend It Like Bratback is going to... <laughs> the, next, the next episode is going to be Bend It Like Bertie. Bertie Old. Listen, Jim Orr has sent me this play, draft one, then the next draft, then the next draft, then the next draft. No, it's not as if I can say, oh, I'm busy now and stuff like that. I'll watch it. Although, no, it's absolutely fantastic. But I know he's going to make it even better and better and better as he does. He's a perfectionist about Jim. But I can't tell you too much about it. But see, when you, <laughs> when it, it is going to storm at this play. But they've got Bertie Old, who's he's one of the most popular Celtic men out there. Now, I sat next to Bertie Old. For 10 hours coming back from Vegas, I was over there entertaining the, the Lisbon Lions and all the Celtic boys and that, right? That was brilliant. So, you know how when you're sitting on a plane, you go, oh, I'll watch a movie, I'll read a book, oh, you know, I'm fed up. Blah, blah. I didn't want that plane journey to end. He's telling me all these brilliant stories and Jim all said to me, can you do Bertie Old? And I was like, oh, right, okay. Like, and I phoned Jim up and I went, right, right, I've been watching the, the, the Celtic thing on Sky, you know that, that thing about famous clubs? It's on Sky and it's maybe 30 minutes on each one. Great clubs and it was Celtic Liverpool. And so I watched the Celtic one again. It was really good. And we bet he was like, we were standing there, standing there in the tunnel. And I'm looking up at Sandro Mazzola. And I'm looking and they were like film stars. They were like film stars. And you saw me and you saw me, Jinky. And I'm looking at them, Sandro Mazzola and the famous Inter Milan. And I just stood there. And I started, and I went, Hail, hail, the Celts are here. Bertie had that, you know, that every syllable a prisoner thing about him. And he, and he, 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 he got right into his world. And I told Jim, and Jim was like, that's it, that's it. And I, it was one of the ones, because people say to me, how do you do, you, how do, you do an impersonation? And it, it's a strange one. Some, I was in a, a monthly show in Oran Moore there called News Hacks, and there was a lot of politicians. So you had to go and learn them. Some of them were boring, Paul, right? They'd need nothing, but you had to but, and learn them on YouTube. There's no fun in that, because that's like your homework. But then other ones, like, like you know, the bold Billy Conley and Tommy Sheridan and all these guys, you, you, you learn, and then you enjoy them, and you have a lot of fun with them, stuff like on the radio and stuff. But the, the Bertie was, I was running it by older people and all that, and they were going, that's, that's brilliant. So I was recording it and going, who's this? Alexandro Mazzola. They were standing there. He was always dead passionate, but he is, you know, big bully. And I turned around, wait, wait, and what did I say? And big bully came in. And that's when I just, and we were standing, and it was magnificent. He's all, but when I came off stage in, in, uh, in Vegas, <laughs> how good's that? Uh, people must be listening going, who's this? So I came off stage, and we're standing outside the next day, and you can imagine the atmosphere, right? It was about 40 degrees, right? I mean, Celsius. It was absolutely roasting. And Bertie's standing there with the wee, the wee can of lager and that went, you were magnificent last night, sir. You were absolutely. See up there when you were doing your Billy Con, even your Sylvester, your Rocky. It was magnificent. And I'm going, this is a Lisbon line. Give me a good review. Brilliant. It was incredible. You, so you don't know. It's, so I'm going to be Bertie all day. You go, the exclusive, you're the first to know, Paul. We're going to do it like Bertie, and it's going to be, I can't say too much about it, I don't think, but let's just say it goes right across the board. Every gen- generation from a teenager to a pensioner will love this play, every Celtic fan. Oh, it's, it's a belter. It really is a cracking script. It's something I'm always interested in, and you get the generational thing if someone gives you their greatest loving of made-up of Celts that they've seen. And sometimes there's a guy in there that might take you by surprise because there's a specific affinity that you've got with them, Des. So if you want to run through your greatest ever Celtic 11. I won't bore you and get into lots of detail as to why. I'll try and be brief, right? I think uh, Big Fraser, 
I think he's a world class goalkeeper. I think the guy's a, he's a giant. But Jim Orr made a good point. I know that sentimental or Ronnie Simpson or that, but <laughs> you know, when you see Foster, right, the guy was nicknamed the wall by Barcelona. Say no more. When a team like Barcelona can't get by him. And look at him that look at him that game against Rangers when he saved mm-hmm. that penalty. And we knew he was going to save it. There's, there's keepers like him and Big Arthur, and you go, he's going to save this penalty. You just knew. Tremendous goalkeeper. We need to tie him up. And I think that was Celtic's most influential signing under Lynn in the last uh, last 12 months, getting I'm him in. Agree with you. Yeah. That yeah. gave that defence confidence that they didn't have before. When you, you know, Big Gordon and all that, you know, was, you know I hope you <laughs> need him, but he was going through a really sticky patch, you know. <laughs> and then, uh, so, no, no question about the best ever, in my opinion, the best ever goalkeeper. Uh, two and three, it would be McGrain and Kieran Tierney. Two absolute crunching, no nonsense fullbacks. I know Kieran will come back one day. He will, you know, Nahern to the boy that caused a big fight with us. You know, he's, he's a young boy. He's away at Arsenal, you know. Um, back, now, you, you said something interesting. Van Dyke is a world class player. He played for Celtic, so should we pick him then? Because he wasn't a Celtic like, legend or didn't he play for many, many years. That's a good point. And obviously, he's gone on and developed days you know we all knew he was something special but he's obviously stepped it up as well since leaving Celtic and you know if you put in Van Dyke, which I did uh, in my team then you're, you're maybe leaving out somebody the like you know well Mialbi was was just solid wasn't he and gorgeous <laughs> by the way he was <laughs> uh, yes he was the women were like he kind of be a fit one like, he was big doll flung but he was solid no nonsense big but, and he was he was a no nonsense he was just a crunch new thing but uh, but do you know the, the funny thing is though? See when you think back to Ronnie Dyler, he had the best centre half partnership that, that we, I can remember. I mean, yeah. Denier and Van Dyke together were astounding footballers. You know, they might not be the big crunch and no not nonsense Malby, but then again, Malby Volharen when he was back, he were amazing as well, weren't they? Imagine playing. Imagine being a centre forward, Des, and having to face that lot. Bobo Baldi. <laughs> well, Baldi just missed. It. I don't think. He just kind of misses the, the, the cup because, it, but by the way, there was a brilliant thing on Sky and you know how when you get all the footballers chatting and Ryan Giggs says, we played Celtic, <laughs> he says to this big guy, Baldi, he was like a heavyweight boxer and I was bouncing off him the whole night. He says, I couldn't get near him, he was a nightmare. I, was, I came up all bruised for heat to toe. So he was obviously feared and for many years Celtic were being bullied by other teams, you know, the, the yeah, bigger yeah. things like Rangers and all that. And then O'Neill just came right in, bang, bang, bang. So uh, it would be Malby and uh, Van Dyke then. That's some back four, isn't it? Malby, Van Dyke, McGrain, Tierney, brilliant. Because you've got them all there. I mean, you've got this Van Dyke could play in his slippers, couldn't he? And, he, and he's, he's... Um, then we're going to make... Now, this is interesting. I heard you having a debate about Nakamura and all that. I would have to stick the awesome uh, Marav check in there. Mm-hmm. We had the conversation. If he signed for Celtic at 33, there's no way any player could ever sign for a football team at 33 and give three years that he gave. An astounding brain, an astounding footballer. And even the pace and all that, that goal at Ibrox with Claus and that, but he just went one way, that way. And I spoke to Larson. He says the, 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 what a player he was. Now Larson talking about Moravchek. So Moravchek's in that team. You can't leave him out. For just a, a one, imagine getting him. You say that at twenty-five. I see the thing with, with Moravchek from talking to a couple of the guys that played with him as well. Des, he was very much, he was very laid back. So he, he wasn't a, a a beast at training, for example. He wouldn't really go for the running side of things. He liked a wee smoke, liked a wee dram, and and he would turn up and just genius. Any any foot, absolute genius footballer. I mean, but also he was he was in the game the whole game. He wasn't like you know I put him on for five minutes. Remember like, the old Nakamura and all that. We did nothing then this bit of thing, this amazing free kick or this. But he was in the game. He was doing his a guy and even thirty six, incredible. Just a, a, an absolute privilege to, to see that guy on the park. Um, obviously a lot McStay. I mentioned him earlier. Need to be McStay in midfield as well. And but then and I, I need to. It's it's a kind of I need you need to have Douglas and Larson up front as well. Douglas to me an astounding talent. I was mentioning, I was talking to these Liverpool players, uh, Liverpool uh, fans on holiday, and we were all sitting there and I said, so we're talking, the Celtic game was on, and it was an Irish bar. I says, who was your greatest? Before I could get to play, they went, Douglas. Now, if a player is, <laughs> now, if Kenny Douglas is Liverpool fans' best ever player, at a time when they won, what, four European Cups, and he was also the best player for Celtic at 10 years, how good a player is he? If <laughs> he's Liverpool's greatest ever in Celtic. So you need to have him and Larson, obviously. But then Jimmy Johnson, how can you leave him out? <laughs> exactly. I didn't see him. I didn't see Johnson, though. But I know that he was obviously legendary. Out of all the Lisbon lines, I know that people are going to go, oh, wait a minute, you. I better put Bertie Alden. <laughs> <laughs> no. 
And as you're right, it's a generation thing. You, you can't leave Larson out. You can't leave you can't leave Johnson out. It was just when you watch when you watch the games. I know you said the grainy footage and all that. That game against Atletico Madrid, it was like Messi. I, I mean, you know, the way it was just we're talking about a massive team in in a world. You know, he ran the show that night. So it, it was a real talent. Oh, it was unreal. And I know people go, oh, I but back then it's different now. You know, guys like Douglas and Johnson would still be an amazing football, you know, in this current thing. You know, they would. They just had a special, special set of skills. I love when I hear that, Des, because it's almost like the same argument of or if Celtic came down. It's not as if Jimmy Johnson of 1967 would be playing in 2017. He would have come through the same training regime, diet, uh, and everything else. And someone says to me, because I says he was a bit of a one-off, Jimmy Johnson, he says, well, watch videos of Garincha. And I did, I went on YouTube, watched Garincha, and it, and it was very similar, you know, the jinky style of uh, dribbling. Unbelievable. Talking to some, it's always a privilege to talk to the, the Lions, and talking to some of the guys, they also put Bobby Murdoch on that pedestal as well, Des, aye, you know? Aye, aye. He was Just the orchestrator. Yeah. Aye, yeah. As soon as, was, 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 you know, was raving about him saying he taught him how to pass a boy, taught him thing, I mean, you know, you know, so he, he, he was some player, and Jockstein said, Murdoch couldn't move, he couldn't, he, he couldn't run, he didn't, but he says, what a brain he had, what a pass. You know, my dad used to always, be, he says, Bobby Murdoch, George Conley, you know, mm-hmm. unsung heroes. Um, my dad was raped, my dad used to rave about George Conley, uh, and he went, oh, that's a boy that should have, he should have been massive, you know, and you, you, know, you, know, you know him, don't you? Big George. Well, I was going to say, when you mentioned Dalgleish and McGrain, what I always say, and I've said to George, is 1986, you've got Kenny Dalgleish, Scoring against Chelsea when Liverpool won the league. Remember, he's a player manager and they win the league in 1986. You've got McGrain, part of that incredible goal that he starts at Love Street wearing the lime green strip. 36. And then you've got Conley. It was really, really sad, but I'm, I'm always really thankful that he came out the other end, Des, and he's he's clean, he's sober, and he's 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 happy and content, which is brilliant, because he never was content, you know, as a Celtic player. Which well, my dad, my dad used to rave about him, um, Bobby Murdoch, uh, all of them. But yeah, he always, he says, that Connolly, what a player. And yeah, he, he just, he had a brief spell at Celtic. But in saying that, I was watching a, a loads of old stuff and there was a Celtic Rangers game and Connolly was the new. And the, 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 I think that commentator was, it was an old YouTube video. And I think the, it was, McF- I can't remember, McPherson, Montford, whatever. They went, this, this, new, this new boy, Connolly, you know. <laughs> I think it was like maybe 19 or something, whatever. But he was running the show, you know, for the back yeah. and for the, all over him. The, the, the comparison to Beckenbauer was not far-fetched and they always said that the guy could play for the back No, he's a big uh, genuine guy really really modest and stuff like that but I, I did bring up Beckenbauer one day with him uh, Des and he says to me he goes I can see the comparisons but I, I could pass the ball better than Beckenbauer <laughs> And he meant it. He meant, he no, meant no, it. No, but that's 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 the kind of confidence you need. Brilliant, brilliant. Could you also tell our, our listeners where we can find you, Des, during lockdown? If we need a wee bit of light entertainment, your kind of uh, live events, etc. Where do we find you online? If you go into Des McLean and Friends Comedy uh, on Facebook, if you're on Facebook, uh, I'm doing a stand-up comedy show every Saturday night via Zoom. I know people are thinking, oh, does that mean he's just playing to the internet? No. If you just buy a ticket and make a wee small donation, me and uh, four other comedians from all over the world, they could be New York, London, Ireland, whatever, are, we entertain you, just you, the people who bought a ticket, the household. who And that's it. It was a fantastic show last night. And uh, we've, been, we've been doing, this will be the fourth, so... It's just from a fiver. And you go onto Facebook, just type in Des McLean or just join Des McLean and Friends Comedy page because I've already got 5,000 friends on the other, the other personal page. A personal page with 5,000 friends. <laughs> so uh, the insecure comedian who's got to accept everybody's a friend. My <laughs> wife's like that. They, they, they 5,000 under your friends. Aye, they are. If they buy a ticket, they are. Aye. But listen, Des, it's been an absolute pleasure for an hour and a quarter chatting to you tonight and last week for an hour as well. Thanks for your time. And um, I'm really looking forward to Bend It Like Bertie. Oh, brilliant. Thanks. For, it's been an absolute pleasure. Uh, you know, this has been a highlight of lockdown. <laughs> for, I don't know how long this is going to go on, but it's, it's, no, it's been a, a pleasure. It's been lovely speaking to you. And that's an hour and a quarter that's just flown by. Listen, stay safe, Des, and hopefully I can catch up with you in person uh, once we get out of this. All right. Same to you, pal. All the best. Hail, hail. 